service begins on page 276. Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first reading this morning comes from the prophet, or this evening, comes from the prophet Isaiah, 52nd chapter, 13th verse. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high, just as there were many who were astonished at him. So marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they have not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and, a, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, no majesty, that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offering and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall select. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. 
yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your face from your servant. 
chapter beginning at the 16th verse. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence in the, to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Please remain seated until the appointed time. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know 
what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus to Caiaphas, to, from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard those words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone, stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, 
and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who at first had come to Jesus at night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout the church year, on a three-year cycle, we hear most of the synoptic gospels read at our liturgies, as well as in the daily office. But no matter what year it is, the Gospel of John is always used a little bit differently at what we might call the spiritual high points, like today. Good Friday, the day of our most solemn observance, and the most serious example of the expansive nature of God's love. I'm sure a biblical scholar could give us a number of reasons why this choice 
to use John on Good Friday just makes sense. But after hearing John's crucifixion account, it should be clear why this gospel reading is read on this very mournful, yet mystical and holy day. Jesus is at the center of the story, and it's almost as though Jesus has reigned over the entire event of his suffering and death. This does not discount the horrible nature of what happened to him, nor does it mean that we should not be critical of our own power structures when they are harmful, like the corrupt Roman Empire was in Jesus' lifetime. This account does not free us from the work we do as Christians. But on the other hand, while it is important to consider present-day power structures, it's not the only focus. In this case, in the Gospel of John, we are drawn into the drama of the person of Jesus and his consistent behavior, language, and message. We are drawn to his reaffirmation that the shallow world around him is not the fulfillment of the Father's kingdom. Because of this, the movement of this Gospel is very, very different. Somehow, the interactions and dialogue within John's Gospel feel slower than the Synoptic Gospels. If you read the other crucifixion stories, they give the impression that Christ's passion was a frenzied event, making it easy to imagine like we are among the crowd of people, watching and even contributing to his suffering. It's as though the Synoptics are more about us and how we react as flawed humans when groupthink takes over. In stark contrast, the Gospel of John feels like the whole external world outside of Jesus is out of focus, or that he is a leading character with the spotlight shining solely on him, while the rest of the characters stand in a shadowed tableau. It's a slow-motion monologue of Jesus revealing the truth, while everything surrounding him falsely points to, do to doubt, denial, and fear. And throughout this crucifixion story, there is the consistent message that Jesus had from the very beginning of John's Gospel. Jesus is the true Son of God, the Messiah, the Word. And this Word, bringing about the reign of God, embodies the Creator's love. In Christ's repeated rejection of earthly powers, he strengthens the impact of his own words. The soldiers and the chief priests literally fall down in his presence when he speaks of the power of God's true kingdom. This tells us in this account of Christ's passion that we need to be concerned less about what is factually true and more concerned about truth with a capital T. With each response and action of Christ, the weight of God's love feels heavy, thick, and powerful like the entire cosmos is falling onto our laps. Looking back earlier on in John's Gospel, we hear the simple, pithy phrase that God is love. But Christ, at John's crucifixion, proves to be much more powerful than this straightforward, well-known phrase. At the crucifixion, Christ shows us just how loaded of a statement that really is. Jesus shows us that God's love challenges us and puts us at odds with what we know. God's love is not like a fluffy teddy bear, but more of an earth-shaking, system-shattering, world-changing experience. Most of all, God's love is proven to be much greater than the errors of humankind. As we read on, Jesus continues to reveal the truth to an audience of clueless people. When Jesus says, Why do you strike me? It does not appear to be a plea to end his own suffering, but to point to the absurd reality that his tormentors have created, and the reality that we have created as well. In a disordered world, without God's love at the center, there is chaos, discord, confusion, and separation. Jesus experiences this directly as almost all of his followers, one by one, abandon him out of an allegiance 
to the much more comfortable world they knew before becoming his followers. Jesus places himself at the center of the chaos, but this does not slow him down or mute his mission to be the embodiment of love. In contrast to the other Gospels, he walks to his death alone, carrying both the literal and metaphorical weight the whole way. As the story makes its way to his final words, we are once again grounded in the truth. Christ utters, it is finished, and breathes his last breath. The old reality of chaos leaves us in those three words, and we are no longer separate and alone, but restored. With his death, Christ lays down an entrance into the new kingdom. Christ has taken our destruction, bedlam, and pain, and reoriented it so that we can once again be in total unity with God. So while we mourn Christ's death on this solemn day, let us do so while remembering God's deep, abiding, overwhelming love. Let us do so while remembering that death and separation do not have the last word. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for Mark, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. to the truth, 
and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in God, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have now loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. That we may be glad to your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Let us pray together in the words our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, Lord, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our 